Good afternoon and good morning and welcome to the second OECD Champion Mayors webinar. Uh, my name is Marissa Plouin and I lead the Champion Mayors program at the OECD. I'm happy to have you here with us today. Champion Mayors Initiative is a global coalition of around 50 mayors from around the world, including Mayor Garcetti in Los Angeles and Mary Dalgo in Paris. And these are mayors who have made inclusive growth a top policy priority in their cities. And this initiative is part of a broader program at the OECD that focuses on inclusive growth. And this is really an initiative that takes a multidimensional approach to how cities can cities and no, national governments can address uh, rising inequality and inclusion. So I would invite to you, you to reach out to us via social media or um, our website to learn more about the program. And while we figure out our PowerPoint presentation, uh, just to remind you that the uh, this webinar series, is, the objective is to bring together uh, cutting edge OECD data and analysis on inequality and inclusion with real world experiences from cities around the world. And in today's discussion, we're going to take a closer look at how cities are putting equity and inclusion at the heart of their climate change strategies. So we'll hear from experts from two cities that are leading on this front around the world, first from Los Angeles, California, and then from Paris, France. And I'd like to thank both of our experts for joining us here today. And this webinar is also contributing to a broader project that the OECD is leading jointly with United Nations Environment Program and the World Bank called Financing Climate Futures. And the discussion that we have will feed into a case study that we'll be launching at the Global Climate Action Summit in September uh, with some of our champion mayors, uh, including Mayor Hidalgo and Mayor Garcetti. So let me introduce our speakers. We'll first hear from Katie Goldman, who is the C40 City Advisor to Los Angeles and the Climate Advisor to Mayor Garcetti in Los Angeles. We'll then hear from Jan Francoise, who is Head of Climate, Energy and Circular Economy Strategies from the City of Paris. We'll have some concluding thoughts from Sena Segbedzi, who is a policy analyst who seconded to the OECD from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. And then we will uh, open up to Q&A with you, uh, with you, our listeners. And you are invited to ask your questions throughout the, the webinar via the chat function. Uh, and we will compile them throughout uh, the, the presentations of speakers. And we'll do our best to respond to those during the Q&A. And if there's anything we don't get to during that time, uh, we will follow up via email with any questions. So before turning to our speakers, I'd like to just briefly set the scene, uh, highlighting some of the work that the OECD has done in this area in partnership with some of our institutional partners like Lincoln Institute and also the C40. Um, so first, the big question is why are cities incorporating an equity dimension into their climate change strategies? I think the first point is that cities are really on the front lines of both of these challenges, climate change and inequalities. Um, I think we know well that cities contribute over 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions and are responsible for two thirds of energy consumption. But also in terms of physical damages that are coming uh, and, and human and economic losses from natural disasters, uh, 2017 was one of the costliest years on record and nine out of 10 cities globally are located in areas that have a high vulnerability to natural disasters. At the same time, if we look at the inclusion and inequality side, we know that over the past three decades, income inequality has risen by 40% in OECD countries and city, the challenge is more acute in cities. In a 10 country sample that we have uh, done at the OECD, we see that income inequality is higher in cities relative to the respective national average. So that's the first reason. I think the second reason and something that we're gonna hear a little bit more from uh, Los Angeles and Paris is that these two phenomena tend to be mutually reinforcing. And what we're seeing is that climate change impacts are poised to entrench existing inequalities in cities. And one of the reasons is that many in many cities, low income populations have increased exposure to climate risks and hazards, whether they live in neighborhoods that are more uh, at risk of flooding uh, or landslides. They also have a higher susceptibility to damages um, as they're likely to live in homes that aren't properly, they can't withstand some of the climate damages uh, that, that we see, whether it's poor insulation, whether they're low lying structures. 
Um, and finally, low income populations tend to have a much lower capacity to recover when they do face challenges. And this can be because they lack often ac lack access to social insurance systems and safety nets. So in cities around the world, we've really seen how these two, uh, two phenomena can, can interact um, and very concrete ways how economically vulnerable populations are at higher risk of, of climate uh, impacts. And for instance, our work in Seoul in Korea really showed um, one of the one of the risk at risk groups is the elderly population who on the one hand it tends to be uh, poor and on the other hand is really quite at risk of heat waves uh, and other challenges. So the third point is some good news. Uh, and I think this is where we'll also be hearing from our cities who are present with us today is that local governments have authority over some of the essential dimensions to reach low carbon and inclusive uh, growth whether this is in terms of policy domains, housing, mobility, energy, environment, um, whether it's in terms of spending and investment. And here our work at the OECD from our Global Observatory on Subnational Government and Finance, we see that across 35 OECD countries, close to 60% of public investment is undertaken by local and state governments. So they have a huge potential, a huge opportunity to respond to some of these challenges. And Senna will be coming back to this point and in her intervention. And finally, I think one of the things we've seen in the past two years is a very strong political will coming from mayors around the world to take a stand on both climate change and equalities, whether through the Paris Agreement and the role that cities can and are willing and are already playing, uh, or as we've seen at the OECD through the Champion Mayors Program uh, on the issue of inequalities. So I'd like to take the temperature before we pass to Katie uh, with our participants. And we'll have a first pop-up question, a pop-up polling question, which you should see on, the, on your screen. In your city, what do you think, who do you think is most at risk from climate change damages? And you have five options here. You can only choose one. Uh, you'll have 90 seconds uh, to a minute to two minutes to respond and be sure to hit submit so we can track uh, your response. So while you're responding, let me go over a few housekeeping details. The first, if you have any technical issues, but you can hear what I'm saying, uh, please contact the host via chat. This is intended to be a very interactive and dynamic webinar uh, through chat, through polling, through Q&A and surveys. Um, please engage in that, stay with us and, and enjoy. Um, if you have questions through, for the speakers throughout, please send them to the question moderator uh, via your chat function. And we will answer those at the end. Uh, we will come to those all together. And we also encourage you to get on social media, uh, tweet, our hashtag is Champion mayors. So on our poll, how are we are we getting close? Okay, we have 20 seconds left. Countdown, one response only. There is no wrong or right answer. And it'll be interesting to see how your responses um, measure up to what we see, uh, Katie and Jan in, in Los Angeles and Paris. So let's close the poll. And we'll see what we have. So most people uh, have said that low income and economically vulnerable groups are the most uh, at risk, followed by the elderly and people with reduced mobility and a smaller portion for racial and ethnic minorities and children and youth. So the two top answers, low income, economically vulnerable populations and the elderly and people who have reduced mobility. So with that in mind, Katie, I'll turn it over to you in Los Angeles so you can tell us what you're doing on these fronts. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great, well, thank you, Marissa. It's uh, my pleasure to be here and talk about uh, what we're doing in Los Angeles on climate action and equity. Thank you for having me. Um, today, about 4 million people live in the city of Los Angeles. It's a big city. Uh, over 10 million people live in the greater metropolitan area of Los Angeles. It's the third largest metropolitan metropolitan economy in the world. It's also a very diverse and dynamic place. LA also has many vulnerable communities, <clears throat> low income communities, which we've just referred to, that face 
a disproportionately heavy burden from pollution, traffic, exposure to industrial sites and hazardous waste. Um, and as a result, LA also has an incredibly strong environmental justice advocacy community. And this has definitely shaped and informed LA's approach to its environmental agenda. When Mayor Eric Garcetti first took office, he understood that LA needed more than just an environmental strategy and that we needed to focus on equity. And that understanding materialized into a comprehensive strategy in 2015, LA's Sustainable City Plan. And we refer to it as the plan. So the plan is very unique and important in Los Angeles. As this slide indicates, it sets the course for a cleaner environment, a stronger economy, and a commitment to equity at its foundation. The, as I mentioned, it was published first in 2015. Um, the mayor uses this plan. He's been using it since it was published to manage the city. City departments are accountable for meeting the plan goals. Um, the mayor actually reviews with departmental general managers how they're doing on meeting plan goals um, during their annual review process. Sustainability initiatives in the plan are prioritized in the budget. And we put out annual progress reports every year publicly to um, show how implementation is going. And also, when we first put out the plan, the mayor committed to updating it every four years. And we're actually coming up on that four years now and have started working on updating the plan. And it's an opportunity to look again at how we address equity and to do um, further integration of climate action planning into our sustainability plan. And we are doing that right now uh, with some support from C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. And we're participating in this process with several other cities, including Paris. Um, and so I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing today. So this image shows you the structure of our current sustainability plan. And I'm sharing it with you so you understand how comprehensive the plan is and that equity is clearly a focus. The plan is divided into three parts, as you can see here. Each part has a number of chapters. The equity part has four chapters, air quality, environmental justice, urban ecosystems, and livable neighborhoods. And each chapter lays out a vision, desired outcomes, key strategies and initiatives for achieving those outcomes. Next slide. <clears throat> As we look at our plan and work on our update, our major update in implementing um, a climate action plan, we're looking to expand and enhance our focus on equity. And I wanted to share with you some of the types of information we're using to inform that. And on the right is a map from LA's Resilience Strategy, which was published in March of this year. It shows Los Angeles's most vulnerable populations in red and orange, and these are by census tracts. Um, and in relation to parks, which are the green space on the map. And what I think it should show clearly, if you can see it well enough, is that we have disparity in access to open space in Los Angeles. And open space is important for health, recreation, social cohesion, getting fresh air and having an overall quality of life. And as you can see in LA, we, we don't all have equal access to green space. And this is just one example of the types of disparities we have in LA. Um, and this is the type of information we are working on using to set goals and strategy strategies to ensure more equitable distribution of benefits in the future. We are looking to reduce climate risk exposure to vulnerable Angelinos. In a second, I'll tell you more about one of our most vulnerable populations. And we're also having, as we enter into this process, a very explicit goal for ourselves to ensure that we have equitable distribution of all sustainability benefits, be it access to parks, shade so you can stay cool, clean air, clean water, healthy food, transit, green jobs, and livable neighborhoods. Next slide. 
So some of our most vulnerable people in Los Angeles are also the most exposed to climate risk. We are experiencing increasing heat, flooding, fires, landslides, um, and all of these are real. They're real threats. They're increasing threats as we face a climate that's changing in the future. There are also over 30,000 homeless people in Los Angeles, and many of them live directly in harm's way along our rivers, uh, in, our, in the brush, um, and are directly facing these threats. And so as we update our sustainable city plan, we're very aware of the homeless population and setting goals and strategies to help protect the homeless from climate risk exposure. Next slide, please. So I've just told you about some of our aspirations for updating the plan. We're working on it now. Um, there are also, I also wanted to mention one of our most recent uh, accomplishments with inclusive climate action. It's a success story. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail today, but hopefully I'll pique your interest and you will go learn, go find some reading to learn more about it. And I have a link at the end of this slide that can help you find more information on this. Um, so in California, we have a landmark legislation that requires 25% of our funding from the or our proceeds that we take in from our cap and trade program, which hopefully you're aware of. 25% um, of the proceeds from that program must go to fund projects in our poorest and most polluted neighborhoods. So this is a statewide program. This year, Los Angeles was awarded $35 million in state cap and trade funding for affordable housing and environmental initiatives in Watts which is one of our most disadvantaged communities in Los Angeles. And this happened through something called the Transformative Climate Communities Program, grant program. In Watts, the money will be spent on affordable housing, bicycle safety and education, electric buses, electric vehicle car share for that neighborhood in Watts, low income weatherization, urban greening, and food waste prevention and reuse programs. All of these programs are in Watts and for the residents of Watts. The application was put together by a coalition of community-based organizations and was informed by extensive year-long, multi-year-long stakeholder engagement. And at its core was an inclusive process resulting in climate benefits for a disadvantaged community in Los Angeles. Three LA community-based applications were considered for this grant and the city of LA in my office in particular and the mayor's office of sustainability provided support to all applicants. We provided assistance to make sure that LA had at least one successful project and we'll continue to work on bringing uh, more cap and trade funds into Los Angeles to help our disadvantaged communities. Next slide, please. So finally, I, I just want to um, reiterate, I mentioned earlier that Los Angeles is working with C40 to implement climate action planning for the Paris Agreement. And C40, um, a key pillar of their um, program is to promote inclusive climate action, recognizing that this is important for everyone. Um, they're developing this program. Through their program, they're developing tools and resources for all cities so everyone can implement inclusive climate action, learning from the experience in Los Angeles, the experience in Paris, the experience of many other cities around the world with trying to implement this inclusive approach. And through inclusive climate action, the hope is that other mayors will be supported and inspired to act quickly and create a city-led global movement for ambitious and inclusive climate action. The C40 program is led by Katerina Safarti and David Miller. And if you have a chance to learn more about that program, I encourage you to do so. There's a, a link at the end of this presentation as well, providing you with more resources. And if we could go to the next slide, I'll finish with just a listing here on a timeline, some of the um, forthcoming strategic resources that when available can be access accessed by other cities to help them also implement inclusive climate action. And finally, one more slide. Um, 
I don't know if these slides will be made available, but so you have them. Here are links to some of the resources I mentioned today. The Sustainable City Plan, which I encourage you to take a look at. The Resilience Strategy that came out in, in uh, March. A link to a press release on the Watts uh, grant application success, which I mentioned. And then finally, a link to further resources from C40, which I think can help you with your climate action planning and also uh, working on inclusive climate action. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And that's a perfect moment to tell you that, yes, the PowerPoint slides will be made available to uh, to all participants and to anyone in the public uh, about, say, a couple 48 hours to th three, four days, maybe after after this uh, after this screening, uh, we'll have the full recording of the webinar available as well as the slides. So please don't hesitate to tune in. If you have questions for Katie, feel free to send those via chat. Uh, to our question moderator, um, and we'll come to them towards the end of this. And I'd now like to pass the floor to Yann Françoise, who is Head of Climate, Energy, and Circular Economy Strategies for the City of Paris, so we can learn more about what Paris is doing. Thank you, Yann. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning, Cathy. Good afternoon for everyone. Uh, it's a nice pleasure to be here and to, to share the experience of the city of Paris uh, with you. Uh, let me introduce my, compared to LA, I'm sorry, my little city uh, of uh, 100 square kilometers with 2.3, quite 2.3 million inhabitants. Small city, but one of the densest city in, in Europe. Uh, density is a good opportunity to develop new public transportation, district heating, very good retrofitting topics. But also, when you have so many people in small territory, you have high exposure to climate risk and vulnerability for the city. So in 2007, the city of Paris adopted its first climate action plan. I won't go, of course, into the detail of this first climate action plan, but maybe to, to answer to the question, why do you include inclusivity, inclusion in your climate action plan? So, I don't know why maybe in 2007, I have maybe to recognize it was not the first goal, of course, of the plan. Uh, our first goal it was to mitigate uh, our GAG emission and after to adapt the city of Paris because we are in the north part of the planet. So we are the responsibility to mitigate and we have less case of adaptation that we, if you are in city like Quito, Bogota, uh, but more and more, finally, uh, as LA experiences after 10, 12 years of experiences, uh, is, is this climate action plan is now totally integrated to all the policy of, of the city. And if we, we, we have some lesson, lessons learned from this plan, the first one may be when we, we, you, you took the example of our program to retrofit the social housing units. It was one of the priority of the previous mayor to retrofit massively the social housing. Currently, we have retrofitting in 10 years 36,000 units. It's very important. Of course, the goal is to reduce the energy demand, so we improve the GHG emissions. But Finally, we discover that we reduce, of course, the bail of the tenant. Each tenant, each family earn around 300, 400 euros a year, and we tackle energy poverty. So finally, with a, an environmental program, we can have a social program and connection links. That's very important. But on the other side, we, we have like, every year some new wonderful eco district with high level performances for new buildings and so on. And finally, what happens? Like everywhere, the price of the square meter up, higher and higher that usually in, in the other side just close. So maybe with the climate action plan, we can have a disruption between low income and high income is a wonderful eco district. So how to connect the link? And one of the decision finds the new action plan and the, the, the new mandate of the mayor is to increase the percentage of social housing in those eco district. So of course, there is a risk for the city, a risk of the uh, of part of money, of course, to, 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 to sell the land lower, but to be sure that we can have a mixity and social equity. So in, when we have a climate action plan, we have to be aware that we can have some risk to 
decrease the quality of, of, of social equity in our city. And so Mayor Hidalgo has us, like a lot of colleagues wherever in the world, to have now a new climate action plan to be carbon neutral, to respect the Paris Agreement. And of course, win one main decision, we want to have a carbon neutrality plan for the city, carbon neutrality pathway, but to be sure that we will see still a fairer city, inclusive city, and of course, resilient. And one of the, um, the first solution was to increase our way of thinking the plan and to open the discussion to all the stakeholders, all the citizens, all the companies, but also the insurance, the banks, the social dealers, all the city, uh, the citizen city councils in the city to have high, high level income and low level, level income people in our dialogue, in our council. It was a huge work of 18 months, more times than usually. But it, it was very important because one of the first conditions maybe to, to, to go to carbon neutrality is to, to try to dream together, but to design the pathway together and to make people understand the consequences of this pathway because this transition may be brutal from some of people and some companies. So we have to be sure that everybody can understand the consequences of the decision and how to implement it, maybe stay step by step, day by day after that. So after 18 months, the plan was just adopted last March after two decisions of the city council, each time adopted unanimously. And of course, we, I, I can talk about the targets and so on, but what is very important that the mayor that go say to the citizen, now we need your vote or your advice is on this plan. We try to transform all your ideas in this plan to be carbon neutral, to be fairer city, but we, we, we need to be sure that we well understand what you want. So we will create what we call in French and in Switzerland, especially a uh, votation. And finally, 70, 75,000 people vote to the plan. Most of them, of course, say, well, it's, yes, it's good. It's a good plan, good to know and follow the, the, the principles. But what is very important is that 30,000 of those voters decided to follow the plan. And we need to have some information. And 15,000 of them, because we want to become volunteers of the plan. So now we have 15,000 people in the city that can be our relay to help people to understand, to explain the consequences that what does it mean to be carbon neutrality, like it's explained in, 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 in the slide, to have zero local emission. What does it mean? It means that we have to divide by two the energy demands and to get 100% of renewable energy. But to get 100% of renewable energy is not so easy for everybody. We know currently that to pay green energy is higher to pay conventional energy. So we have to be sure when we develop a program that we, we are um, a very uh, fair food program for everyone. And we are quite sure that a lot of people in Paris can divide by two the energy demand by retrofitting the buildings but not everybody. So we have to be sure that usually as we, we did before, but with more uh, intensity now, if we did decided some initiative to have more incentive for low income people compared to high level people, but to maintain a certain part of, of, of income. And of course, on adaptation part, to be sure that the most vulnerable people are to protect because now with the volunteer is quite a plan made with the Parisian, for the Parisian, and to be sure that we can be very fairer for, for everybody. Because we talk about, for example, a lot of, of green mobility, to ban diesel cars, to ban uh, gasoline cars in English, uh, fuel cars. And, but we want to switch. Of course, we want to reduce the traffic, but a part of the cars will be shift to green maybe, cars, green electricity, biogas, hydrogen, maybe. But currently, it costs more than usually. So for low-income people, how to be sure that we have enough public transportation for them, or maybe free floating system, but cheaper for them. So it's now maybe a way of thinking differently in the city, maybe as also I, as a, a regulator because we have a lot of private economy in our city, like in LA or San Francisco, you have new system of free floating, but for a citizen, for a mayor, how to regulate that? 
you have no rules. Maybe you have to create those new rules and to be sure that this new modern way of, of, of thinking, new modern way of mobility is not reserved only for a part of the populations. That's very important for us. That's one of the main message as a message of our goal for 2030 is to have a pure air in Paris. It's important, of course, for everybody, but we all know that most vulnerable people are low income people in the city. Connection to the health system to be sure that everybody can access to the health system. It was the same thing for us. The main climate risk is like last week, a big, big heat waves in the city. And during this period, infant and elders people are very vulnerable. So we have to be sure that if we want to retrofit a district to retrofit where the, 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 the houses are very bad installations, where we have maybe elder people, not obligatory low income or high level income, because when you, you live in bad insulation building under the roof, you have the same risk. So we have to, to, to have this new criteria in our way of thinking, and not only, if that's very important, but carbon footprint, JJ emissions. And thanks for that, with a climate action plan, you can drive globally a general policy of the city. And it's why maybe Mayor Garcetti, Mayor Hidalgo has the same way of thinking and not only because we have the next city of the Olympic Games, but to have a fairer city with a climate action plan and to be sure that it will be a city for all the citizens to protect the city for the next weeks and to anticipate our responsibility to decrease, of course, our GHG emission, but for everyone, not only for a part of the people. One of the main motto of the Mayor Hidalgo is that said, we want to be a carbon neutral city, but with everybody, and we don't want to let anybody outside the land. That's very important for us. Merci beaucoup, Yann. Thank you, Yann. Um, I think there's some really interesting points, maybe just to pick up quickly on, on both the interventions we heard from Los Angeles and Paris. And, and first, just the question of how do you protect the most vulnerable? Well, you have to first identify who they are and where they are. And that looks a little different maybe from, from Paris to Los Angeles, whether um, Katie mentioned the, the homeless population, which is significant uh, uh, in Los Angeles. And so what are some, some, some measures that you can do? Um, and that's a pretty tricky, sticky issue you know, without even putting climate change in, in there, that's already something that's challenging to address. Um, I think uh, interesting to hear from the city of Paris that this equity focus, it's really an evolution maybe over the past uh, two decades where um, initially climate change uh, measures by cities were really focusing on climate change and now it's broadened a bit in its scope. Um, I think one interesting point we heard from both Paris and Los Angeles was really in terms of inclusion, it's also about the stakeholder engagement and an inclusive process and what that looks like and that it takes a little more time, uh, I think, in, in most cases. Um, and finally, just uh, one interesting point to, to maybe connect to some work that we've done as well. Um, Jan mentioned uh, in Paris when they launched the climate change plan, that 15,000 people wanted to become volunteers. And I think that's something very interesting. Uh, we saw in the case of Seoul in Korea, uh, where they basically got 100,000 volunteers, people living in the city who wanted to kind of become climate change ambassadors. They went around uh, in their neighborhoods and they identified who were the most uh, at risk? Who were the most vulnerable people? Where were they? Was it elderly? Was it infants? And what might they need if in, in the case of a climate related event, whether it was a heat wave or a flood, et cetera. And so they, the city, they helped the city anticipate what some of those needs would be where um, in advance of anything of anything happening. So I'd like to turn the floor to uh, Sena Segbetsi for some, for some concluding thoughts. And I think one of the points Jan made, uh, um, also we've talked a lot about the climate change impacts uh, on, on equity, but also thinking about the policy dimension and what about the climate change policies and how they in, impact uh, equity. And so I know Sun is going to touch on that um, as well as some other things. Thanks, Marissa. It is really great to see the, the evolution of um, climate action plans in cities and the focus and the lens on equity. I want to start with, or I'll talk about three main ways or three ways that uh, of building out inclusive climate policies. And 
As we've mentioned, the, uh, the impact on climate-related events can disproportionately impact certain populations, but also our responses. So climate policies that are trying to um, make more expensive the uh, high carbon activities can disproportionately impact um, certain um, segments of the population. If you're thinking about where your low income population lives and if they live in the suburbs or in distant suburbs and are coming into the city to for work or other social services, um, things like congestion charges can um, have cost burdens to these populations. But a way to defray these costs is to then use the income that's earned through these um, charges to uh, invest in public transportation or transportation alternatives so that these these populations can remain connected to the central business district, but have alternatives um, that are lower carbon. Another way is um, the climate change and inclusive growth have many touch points in cities. And one is through the urban form and land use and how the policies are, um, are implemented, where housing goes, where uh, mitigation factors go. So uh, things like mitigation um, policies and responses tend to favor land use that is dense. Um, these are your compact city structures, your transit oriented development aimed at getting to lower greenhouse gases by shortening the distance with travel for, um, for residents. However, they also have impacts on where your housing can go, um, where your social services are, um, future housing and how it's built and where it's built. Another um, is adaptive policies tend to be more land, uh, land, um, they tend to use more land if you're thinking about ecological um, ways to uh, respond to, to climate change. These are using green um, or different services or environmental uh, conservation sites to impact the or to serve as a cooling effect for um, for cities. And urban form, right, is dynamic. Urban areas are dynamic. So it takes a mix of mitigation and adaptation responses and policies to really build out an, an inclusive and sustainable climate response in cities. But that affects, like I said, your housing, your services. So it's important to look at for not only now, but for the future populations where they're going to live and um, how to make space for them with your land constraints. A third, and what uh, Marissa mentioned about the subnational governments being also a um, a growth generator for cities, so or cities being a growth generator and using their capacity to as, as spenders, as investors in the um, public realm to to answer to both incl inclusive growth uh, strategies and climate action strategies. One, one way is with the, the future, the anticipated infrastructure investments coming along the line in the next 15 years, anticipated at 90 trillion, 70% are said to be directed towards cities. Now, this um, these elements could set up the right conditions for land value capture. And what land value capture is, it's a way for, is when policies or investments in land through the public realm um, result in land value increments. And increments are income that come from the investments to and the improvements to land through public action. So I'll give you an example. A city decides to build a metro line. They have a new stop in a neighborhood. As a result of this connectivity, the, the property values around the stop increase. Uh, a way for a city to capture some of that value that they've now created because of this investment is to use tools, uh, land value capture tools, like taxes, fees, charges. I'll stick to one. 
exaction. So exaction charges can come in in a form of the local authority getting payments directly from a developer or the developer um, building in-kind contributions to, uh, to their development. So using a portion of the land to um, serve as a social or public facility. And this can in turn be used for environmental conservation or other social impacts that are needed, um, needed for residents. Uh, for instance, in this uh, city of Rio, um, in a part of the municipality, they made one developer uh, develop a rainwater capture system as a part of their in-kind contributions. So uh, there are many ways to leverage some of these investments that are happening in cities to get both at your low carbon transition and your social and public benefits. Thank you, Senna. Um, I'd like to check back in before we transition to questions uh, for our speakers, and please keep sending those along via chat. Um, let's check back in with our participants with our second poll and see if we've changed your mind, perhaps at all, uh, from what from what you've heard, um, and and whether the experiences you've heard about today from Paris, from Los Angeles, uh, from from different experiences of the OECD, how have those um, how do those resonate with what you're experiencing in your cities and communities? So our next poll question is: Which policy area is the top priority in your city to simultaneously address climate change and inclusive growth? You have five choices: energy housing in the built environment, transport, water, E, other, and please tell us what that other is via chat. So you'll have about, this will be up for two minutes or so. Um, be sure to hit submit and you can only vote once. Uh, and while we have that going, um, I'd like to turn to the Q&A with our panelists. Um, and we've compiled your questions, so please, you can keep sending those in. Um, the first question would be for both Katie and Jan. Um, what do you think will be the game changer, the big, the big thing to reduce your city's carbon footprint in an inclusive way by 2030? So what's going to bring the most transformational change in your city? So I'll, um, I'll let Katie uh, go to that first and then, and then to Jan. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you everyone for such an interesting conversation. Um, biggest game changer for, for our city. I mean, we, um, Los Angeles uh, owns and controls its power company, the Department of Water and Power. And the, de the department is actively uh, pursuing more renewable energy and, and is on target to meet both its state requirements for renewable portfolios, for having a renewable portfolio of energy and also on going further than what's required by the state. So I think um, a huge game changer for us is uh, providing more renewable energy through our power company, um, but also uh, as we try to encourage more loss, more people in Los Angeles to put solar panels on their roofs, um, we need to think about are the incentives that we're offering them. And so our Department of Water and Power does provide uh, rebates for solar panels and cool roofs. Um, currently, those rebates are focused on, for example, single family homes. And so um, a game changer for us, it, it feels maybe small, but I think it's uh, it aligned with the equity conversation is to make sure we provide incentives that work for everyone, uh, people who don't own their homes, uh, multifamily dwellings, um, and uh, not just for solar panels, but for electric vehicle charging. Uh, we need to provide access to those resources for everyone. And we have a number of ways that we're doing that. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, uh, for City of Paris, uh, the game changes as I said, as for LA is of course to get 100% of renewable energy by 2050 to provide the city, to supply the city. But to be sure to, 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 to get that, we need to divide by two the energy demand. And that's the, the, the main issue for us. So it, it, it needs, we, needs, we need to retrofit 1 million flats, public, social, or private flight. And 
as you know, Paris is a built city, so the challenge is now in the new buildings, is to retrofit the stock. That's the main uh, game changing by 2030. And currently, our goal is to maybe reach the reasons to retrofit, if we want to succeed in 30,000 units a year around 2030. It means that currently compared to now is to multiply, to multiply, to multiplicate by 25 percent the current, 25 the current with them. So, as you said before, alone we can't do it. We need the the comprehension, the solidarity of everybody from, of course, all the different public level, regional level national level, maybe European level, but also all the stakeholders. It's currently very hard to have a loan from a bank to a private owner to retrofit their building. So we have to improve all the chain and the supply chain, and we have to, to, to work with together state by state. It's why we try to include in them in all the process of the decision. That's the main challenge, to retrofit the private buildings of the city and all the older buildings. Thanks to both of you. I think it's it's interesting to hear, we, we hear the same start of the answer, renewable energy, and the path to get there sounds a little bit different, or depending on where you are. Um, and that not just that, but that the challenge, I mean, in, in terms of getting to uh, renewable energy objectives, um, it, it certainly requires a level of ambition that can seem daunting, but I think uh, what we're seeing is that cities are really taking this head on and saying, we, we have to do it and we're going to do it. Um, a next question we have um, for both Katie and Jan, is there a plan or resilience strategy? Uh, yes, that includes nearby cities in, in uh, Los Angeles and Paris. So how, I guess in other words, how is how are your cities working with your neighbors, working with your neighboring administrations to address some of the challenges um, relating to climate change and, and equity? And I don't know if Jan, you wanna start with that one? So uh, the answer is, is yes, we we have a, a resilience strategy and adaptation strategy of the city of Paris. And of course, we, we, we don't stop the discussion with only the, the, the citizens of Paris. There is no boundaries uh, on, on those issues. And as for the climate action plan, we have a discussion with all the city around the, the Paris. But now we have an unofficial and official metropolitan area called Greater Paris, metropolis of Greater Paris that by the law have the role to coordinate all the action from the cities and the city of Paris on mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. So, and last, uh, and next, sorry, September, uh, the new metropolis of Greater Paris will adopt uh, their first climate and adaptation plan, gathering all the data from the city of Paris with the same commitments, that's a good idea. Uh, and so, yes, there is a coordination. And Katie, can we hear from you perhaps on, on how LA is working on this? Sorry, I think I was talking on mute. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned in my remarks early on that the greater LA area has over 10 million people. And so that LA area includes over 90 small cities plus Los Angeles, or smaller cities. And so we do have, um, and, and if you've been to Los Angeles before, you'll see that one city blends into the next. It's almost hard to see where one city ends and the other begins. It's a very contiguous, large metropolitan area. And so we do, you know, I think it is important to look at sustainability and climate action across the whole metropolitan area. Our transportation system, you know, is operated more regionally. And so transit is a really key aspect of what we're trying to accomplish. So certainly we coordinate. The mayor, Mayor Garcetti, is, um, sits on the board of the Metropolitan Transit Authority. I think he's the chair of the board currently. So he does... Uh, play a role influencing regional um, transit, 
but also um, we have a very close relationship with the LA County Office of Sustainability, who is also at the same time working on their sustainability and climate action plan. So as a city in the county, we're participating in that process as well. And we're in touch with the county um, on a regular basis. So we're really trying to closely coordinate our actions so that we have consistent goals um, and are working in conjunction with each other to maximize the impact across the whole region. Excellent, thanks Katie. And before we transition to our next question, I wanna close the poll and, and let you know about the results. I think we had some convincing speakers because uh, the policy areas that are considered to be the top priority in your city to simultaneously address climate and inclusion 30% responded housing and the built environment, 19% with transport, and 7% with energy. So we'll keep keep that in mind as we as we work through the rest of our our Q and A. Um, we have a question for you, Sana, uh, which is: Today we're listening quite a bit to what Los Angeles and Paris are doing, um, but they're not the only cities that uh, that are out there. Um, so what perspective can we keep in mind, or what might be different for cities in emerging economies and developing countries that they are maybe thinking about in a different way than what how Paris and, and Los Angeles might be addressing this? That's a great question. Um, as Jan mentioned, a lot of the uh, the activity that will be happening in Paris will be around retrofitting and um, changing old infrastructure. But with developing cities, um, a lot of the activity uh, and investment will be made in building new infrastructure. And that will take, uh, of course, mountains of capital. And for some uh, emerging cities, access to capital is access to finance is a, a barrier because of the fiscal autonomy and um, the credit worthiness. So they're not able to get debt finance or be able to collect taxes in order to pay for this infrastructure, which means that there needs to be a relationship between the national level governments and the subnational level governments in transfer transferring the necessary resources to uh, two cities to be able to build out their infrastructure needs. So a lot of policy coordination um, will be will be needed in, in uh, developing cities and definitely the new crop because of the economic um, economic growth happening in these cities will put different and new demands on infrastructure. Great, thanks, Senna. Um, we have a question from one of our listeners, which is thinking about some of the lessons that we can we can learn from Paris and Los Angeles that other cities can latch onto. Um, one of them is really, what would be your tips, your 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 tips and advice um, for local governments on how to communicate and engage with citizens around this topic? If you said something that worked extremely well in your city, and I would even add a twist, or something that really didn't work well at all, could also be interesting to to learn from. So Katie, do you want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> Jan's going to give it some thought. <laughs> um, it's a great, great question. I think um, in Los Angeles, as I mentioned earlier, we have a really strong environmental justice community and that helps us, um, that really helps us with stakeholder engagement because we can engage with the advocacy organizations directly and we have a, a big coalition, we call them our sustainability stakeholders, and we meet with them quarterly and we have engaged them um, in working groups in updating our sustainable city plan. So because we already have a well-organized environmental justice advocacy community, it is, it's a little bit easier to get input efficiently. Um, we also, uh, you know, are still considering um, how to engage at a more community-based level. Um, and I think it's challenging. I don't have any great answers. I think what happened with our Transformative Climate Communities Grant and the Watts, um, it's called Watts Rising um, Collaborative, was really um, what we want to see more of, which is really on the ground community engagement. It, it um, was facilitated through our housing authority and um, was incredibly intensive, but in the end was the kind of community-based engagement that's also um, 
you know, I think important to have in this process. And I'll just say one sort of, I'll, I'll pivot a little bit and talk about one of the challenges, I think, with the topic we're talking about and engagement is that as a policymaker who thinks, who's thinking big about transformational actions and maybe transforming our entire energy system, um, you know, we are thinking on a different level than um, somebody who wants to make sure they, their sidewalks are repaired in their neighborhood and their trash gets picked up. I mean, the, the sort of, when you ask about quality of life and we're thinking about, you know, uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure and other people are thinking about trash pickup, it's, you need to find a way to talk to each other and find the common ground where the actions are also helping the climate program, but also um, being seen by the community as helping their quality of life. And I think those things exist is just having the conversation and getting everybody to meet each other in the same place can be challenging. So I don't know if I gave you advice or if I just raised more issues, but um, there you have it. Well, any good question, any good response asks more questions. So that's just fine. I think Jan will turn to you for a final comment. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have good tips or not, because first, uh, we have learned after maybe 12 years experiences that we, we have to use the background to for the communication and to adapt the speech to, to the different level, to different stakeholders. But maybe one from the lax experiences, the votation and the volunteers, because one of the questions was what kind of platform do you use to animate the volunteers? What's funny, finally, in the last votation, of course, we try to use all the social networks and uh, all the uh, digital system and computers that we can have. And I, I remember that some people from the city of Paris said, oh, be careful. Maybe we can have a lot of people behind the internet. So we have to, to have a very huge platform to be sure that we'll be available during the 10 days of the petition to receive all the votes. And it works, of course. We receive uh, 10,000 votes, electronic votes. So very important. But the mayor decided the two to have to require to the old system. Don't say to the mayor. Yeah, but with ballot boxes in the street, with a flag, with flyers, and and with people to talk to the people. And finally, it works because sometimes when you talk about climate change issues, it's a lewd word for people. When you translate to the street to people, when you go directly to the city and say, "Oh, what does it mean on the property? What does it mean on the waste? What does it mean for for my houses?" And finally, finally, we receive ten thousand electronic votes and sixty thousand individual citizen votes in the boxes. And when we consider that from one more vote, we maybe met three or four Parisians. Finally, we discussed in 10 days with 300,000 people in 10 days, thanks to this old system of communication without no big panels and so on. So sometimes the direct contact, direct link for a, a unique operation can be a good opportunity to explain climate change. Excellent, thank you. And we'll put Jan in charge of your next electoral campaign. Yes. Uh, but uh, we're we're sadly running out of time. This has been a really fascinating discussion uh, with our panelists uh, and our speakers. Um, don't miss the launch of the case study that will incorporate some of the discussions we've had here today that will be at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco. We invite you to continue the conversation on our web platform. You have the address on your screen. Um, some upcoming workshops and webinars of our Inequality Matters series. Uh, one looking at the integration of migrants and refugees with the city of Stockholm. Uh, and in addition, another thinking about the sharing economy and what might be, as we say, the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, around those issues. That's with the city of Athens, and we'll keep you informed of those dates. If you're a city listening in and you have an initiative relating to inclusive growth, you'd like to involve in a seminar, in a webinar like this, please get in touch. And as I mentioned, this has all been recorded and will be made available on the web, web, uh, web address you have uh, on your screen. We would invite you to check out some of our, um, these are not the long publications, so you're in luck. Uh, these are the shorter ones. Uh, so we have on inclusive growth in Seoul, Korea, making cities work for all that kind of puts together a lot of the emerging OECD evidence on inequality in cities. Our classic timeless cities in climate change that was released in 2011. Um, and finally, uh, investing in climate, investing in growth, basically telling everyone that there is a very good economic case to invest in climate change. 
Um, I'd like again to thank our participants. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Senna. Thank you to our listeners. And we hope you'll tune in next time for our next webinar.